All right, y'all, so let's get started. Uh, so today we're going to be closing out chapter 19, which will then close out that third unit. So in preparation for our exam next week. Uh, remember, the exam next week is on t uh, Wednesday and Thursday. All right, so on Monday we'll do some review. I'm going to focus on this material here, uh, the chapter 19 material. On Wednesday, before your exam, we'll also be able to do a little review as well, and then I'll sort of rewind back to the beginning of the unit, the transition metal sort of thing, all right? Um, again, we'll be able to go through this material here today. Uh, there's these worksheets that are posted, right? Uh, for some of them, for some of those uh, worksheet problems, what I actually did is like made a video of me going through the problem step by step. And so for some of the, the answer key for these worksheets are posted, but for some of them you can actually find it like in this video step by step how to do those problems as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're going to pick up where we left off last time, right? So we were able to use our table, our constants page of all that thermodynamic data. We looked at this particular reaction here, the vaporization of water, right, being converted from liquid water to steam. And we used our table to figure out what the delta G of this reaction was. Uh, remember, when we're using this, this table, what do we keep in mind? When we do K uh, equilibrium constants, it's products over reactants. What do we say to ourselves when we use our thermodynamic data? Products minus reactants, right? So that's just kind of what we want to have in mind. All right. And so far, this checks out, right? Uh, we know that this delta G we got was a positive value, meaning that it was non-spontaneous. And the reason why that checks out is because we're specifically talking about delta G naught, and that naught refers to... The, refers to standard state, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So yeah, we're not worried about liquid wa water spontaneously converting to steam at 25 degrees Celsius. So remember, we're at standard state. And we're going to talk a little bit more about standard he state here today. But yes, we know that that's 25 degrees Celsius. Okay. Then we used our table to calculate our delta H of this reaction here. We got this positive value, this endothermic reaction. That also checks out, right? Because in order to go from a liquid to a gas state, those water molecules must absorb that thermal energy, right? Which means it's an endothermic process. So now we're going to do our last thermodynamic variable here, delta S naught. All right, and before we do any math, what would we expect the sign of our entropy to be in this vaporization reaction? Should this be an entropically favorable or unfavorable reaction? If we're going from a liquid to a gas, is that going to create more order or more disorder? Disorder, right? So going from a liquid to a gas, we should get a positive entropy value because this should be a something that creates more disorder or unentropically favorable. So let's everybody take a second and using our table here, 
favorable. Go ahead and calculate our delta S for this reaction. All right, so I'm going to do my delta S. I'm going to take my product, my gaseous water, that 188.8 value, subtract my reactant, the liquid water, that 70 value. So that gets me with 118.8. Okay. One thing that we want to note about our entropy values that are different from the enthalpy and the free energy on this table are the units associated with them. Look, I'll make the rules, but when we tabulate free energy and enthalpy, we tabulate those values in kilojoules, but for entropy, it's in joules, all right? And so if we're going to combine these, we're going to need to square those units away, all right? So let's just keep that in mind for right now. Our units that we get for our entropy value are in joules, specifically joules per Kelvin. Okay, and again, this checks out, right? We got this positive entropy value. So we got these thermodynamic variables for our vaporization of water reaction. Again, the reaction converting liquid water to gaseous water. But like, we're looking at this and it seems like it's a pretty limited piece of information here, right? This is only gonna be true at 25 degrees Celsius. So great, this helps me out for exactly one temperature. What about if I change the temperature to anything else, okay? so. Remember we have this equation that we worked towards at kind of the beginning of this chapter. Delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. All right, this delta G value that we get here from our thermodynamic table is again at standard state, so at that 25 degrees Celsius. And delta G changes dramatically with temperature, all right? But fortunately, delta H and delta S, although they do vary with temperature a little bit, way, way less dramatic. So we can use this equation here to approximate delta G at any temperature other than standard state, right? Using our value for delta H and delta S that we just calculated. Okay, so again, this reaction is non-spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius, all right? But uh, what's the boiling point of water in degrees Celsius? 100, right? So let's take it above that. Let's go ahead and do this calculation at 150 degrees Celsius and see what our delta G value is, okay? So 100 degrees Celsius, in order to use this equation, we are going to have to convert to Kelvin, all right? And it drives me absolutely freaking nuts because it's an exact conversion where you add 273.15, and for some reason your book randomly rounds that off to 273. It drives me crazy, but whatever. So we're going to stick with what our book does here. So in order to get from Celsius to Kelvin, I'm going to add 273.1, uh, nope, just 273, to our degrees Celsius. So 150 degrees Celsius would be 200 and, or I'm sorry, 423 Kelvin. All right, so then to approximate our delta G at this temperature, again, we're above our boiling point, so we're, sh we're hoping that this reaction is spontaneous, i.e. our delta G is negative. We're going to plug in our value for delta H. So delta G equals that 44 kilojoules minus our temperature, 423 Kelvin. 
And this is where we're going to have to keep in mind the fact that our delta S is only in joules per Kelvin. So in order to get it to kilojoules, I'm going to have to take that delta S value on the table and divide it by 1,000, putting it into kilojoules. All right, so now if I divide it by 1,000, I'll be in kilojoules for ke per Kelvin. So let's punch this into our calculator. And indeed, we get this negative value for delta G at 150 degrees Celsius, negative 6.25 kilojoules. All right, so although this vaporization reaction is non-spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius, we see that it is spontaneous. We have a negative delta G at 150 degrees Celsius. All right, so again, we can use this equation here to approximate delta G at all temperatures, right? At any temperature other than 25 degrees Celsius. The value that we get for delta G from our table is only good at that one temperature. But if we want to figure out at any other temperature, we can use this formula here. All right, so let's take, we're going to take these same values, the same equation. We're going to learn to do one more thing with this. All right, again, we're going, that delta G is only really good at that one temperature, so we're going to look at just our delta H and delta S values, as well as our equation here. Okay. Um, this reaction here would be the boiling of water, all right? And so at that boiling point, right, that temperature at which water boils, which again we sort of know just from being in chemistry thus far is 100 degrees Celsius, what it means to be at the boiling point of a substance is that the liquid and gas phase are in equilibrium. All right, so we calculated the delta G at 25 degrees Celsius. It was positive. We went up to 150 degrees Celsius. Now all of a sudden it's negative, right? It had to pass through this point in the middle where the delta G was zero. That's what we call the boiling point of this substance, right? When that liquid and gas phase are in equilibrium with, enough, with one another. Um, and it kind of gave it away. Uh, but what does it mean to be at equilibrium from a delta G standpoint? What's the value of delta G at equilibrium? Zero, zero right? So we can take advantage of this using this formula here to get our boiling point or our boiling temperature of our substance, right? So again, the boiling point is when your liquid and gas phase are in equilibrium. And we know at equilibrium, delta G equals zero. So what we can do is plug that knowledge into this equation here. We get zero equals our delta H minus T delta S, and we can rearrange this equation to solve for T, to determine the temperature at which this substance will boil. All right, and again, for water, that might not be all that interesting because we know what it would be, should be for water, but we could do this for any transition from liquid to gas that we can find on our constants page. All right, so that's some of your homework problems that you're going to be doing, is taking these substances, 
looking up these values and determining the boiling point of those substances. Uh, so everybody take a second and rearrange this equation solving for delta t. Let's, let's practice our algebra here. <coughs> Um, not delta t, sorry, just t. All right, so what you should get is that delta H over delta S equals temperature, right, when delta G equals zero, which is, again, at equilibrium at our boiling point here. So then we can plug in our values here to determine the boiling point of this substance. Again, we just have to keep in mind the difference with our units, right? Delta H is in kilojoules. So I'm going to take that delta S value and divide it by 1,000 in order to square that away. Now my units are in kilojoules, kilojoules per Kelvin. All right, so if I punch this into my calculator, I would get 370. And what are the units on that 370? Kelvin, Kelvin right? Our temperature in our thermodynamic equation is Kelvin. So how am I going to convert to Celsius, something that we're much more used to looking at? I'm going to subtract that 273. And it should be 273.15, but again, won't go there. So we're going to subtract 273. And we see that the boiling point of water, according to this equation here, is 97 degrees Celsius. All right? Now, is that 100 degrees Celsius? No. Okay? Remember, it is just an approximation because delta S and delta H do vary slightly with temperature, but way less than delta G, right? And we got pretty freaking close to the actual boiling point of water just using these values that were tabulated on our constants page here. Okay, so again, we can approximate at different temperatures using those values. That's as good as we can do without doing the actual experiment ourselves. All right, so we're going to look at another reaction here. If we take oxygen. and sulfur dioxide. And these will react to form sulfur trioxide. All right, but before this chemical equation is any good to us, we're going to have to balance it. All right, and the only way to square this off would be to put twos here. I got the same number of sulfurs and oxygens on both sides. All right, let's go to our constants page and look up our thermodynamic values for the, this reaction here. So I got to find each component of this reaction. So they're all listed alphabetically here. I'm going to go to my O's for oxygen. I'm going to grab this here. I'm going to go look under S for sulfur. 
And we see I have sulfur dioxide here and trioxide is right underneath it. Cool. All right, so here's my table. Uh, again, if we looked on our table, that first value is the delta H, the second value is your delta G, and the third value is your entropy. Helps us get our delta S. Uh, we're going to remember what minus what? Products, products minus reactants, all right? But now we gotta worry about here these stoichiometric coefficients, all right? So what do I mean by that? When I do my delta H for this reaction, for example, I'm going to do the delta H of my product, SO3, but I'm going to multiply that by that stoichiometric coefficient of 2, because that is what appears in my balanced chemical equation. There are two sulfur trioxides created in this reaction. Now I'm going to subtract my reactants. And what I need to make sure to do so that that negative sign hits all of those reactants is to put this in parentheses here. I'm going to do my first reactant, the delta H of O2 plus 2 times the delta H of SO2. All right, and again, so that negative sign hits both of those terms. I'm going to put it in parentheses. All right, so everybody take a second using our values on our table here. Punch this into your calculator. Make sure we're all getting the same answer here. So I should get negative 197.8 kilojoules. So is this reaction exothermic or endothermic? Exothermic. Right, did we all get that value? Okay, all right. All right, now let's do the delta S. I guess it's really delta H naught and delta S naught. Let's be careful. All right, so I'm going to do 2 times my product minus my reactants. Again, make sure to put those in parentheses.
All right, and actually, before we, before we do the math here, let's look at this chemical equation. Should this be entropically favorable or unfavorable? unfavorable. I got three gas molecules being converted to just two gas molecules, right? So I'm decreasing my number of gas molecules. I'm creating more order. So yes, we should, would expect a negative entropy value. Okay, and I punch this into my calculator, and again, I get negative 88, but this is in joules per Kelvin. All right, so this is an example of an exothermic reaction, but one that's entropically unfavorable. So we would expect this to be spontaneous at low temperatures, but then at high temperatures become non-spontaneous as that entropy term kind of dominates that equation. Okay, and then we can calculate our delta G, not from this table here, to figure out whether or not it's spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. All right, same idea. Where is that one? I get negative 142. Okay. So at 25 degrees Celsius, is this reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Negative delta G, what does that mean? Negative delta G is good. Negative delta G is a spontaneous reaction, right? So this reaction is spontaneous, specifically at 25 degrees Celsius. All right, so using my thermodynamic variables from my table, I got my delta H naught, my delta S naught, and my delta G naught for this particular reaction. Again, kind of the new thing that we're tacking on here is making sure that we're multiplying each of these values by that stoichiometric coefficient from our balanced chemical equation. All right? Previously it was one to one. That's not the case. What's up? Uh, let me do it again. 2 times 371.1 minus in parentheses 0 plus 2 times negative 300.1. Oh shit, no, I did not. What did I do wrong up here? Oh, no, 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 hold up, hold up. I fucked that up. Uh, 2 times negative 371. Yeah, negative 142. Parentheses, maybe? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Me too, actually, when I did it again. Uh, that's, that's the, well, let's look at uh, how you punched it into your calculator here. But I, I took two times my delta S of my uh, SO3, so two times that value, minus in parentheses this value plus two times that value. If you don't have the parentheses, you won't get it. All right, so uh, let's just review what we said again. So first of all, negative delta G means that the reaction is spontaneous. Positive delta G we called non-spontaneous. All right. What did it mean to be spontaneous? Let me just take our sample chemical equation here. All right? Spontaneous means that this reaction will spontaneously progress in the forward direction, right? So towards products.
and non-spontaneous, like we said, was like a little bit of a misnomer because it doesn't mean that the reaction doesn't happen at all. It means it's actually going to go in the other direction towards the reactants. What was that other measure that we had for whether a reaction favored the reaction, uh, the reactants or the products? What was that other value that we've been looking at up until now to say, oh, this reaction favors the products or this reaction favors the reactants? Our equilibrium constant, right? We looked at our equilibrium constant and we could tell if it was greater than one, that's a reaction that favored the products. If it's less than one, that's a reaction that favors the reactants. So indeed, there is this intimate relationship between our equilibrium constant and our delta G for that particular reaction. Okay? These two are actually connected. If we know our, equal, our, our delta G, our equilibrium constant is equal to E, that magic number from calculus, to the negative delta G naught divided by RT. All right, so again, both of these are kind of telling us the same sort of thing, whether a reaction goes in one direction or the other, and they are indeed intimately related to one another. Our equilibrium constant is connected to our delta G. Equilibrium constant equals E to the negative delta G over RT. Uh, just because uh, logarithms are hard or natural logs are hard, if we wanted to do the inverse of this equation here, that would be natural, uh, whoops, delta G naught equals the negative natural log, oh, no, oops, minus RT natural log of our equilibrium constant. Right, so these two equations are just the inverse of one another. If you have your delta G, you can find your equilibrium constant using this value, or using this equation here. If it's the other way around, you were in the lab and you measured your equilibrium constant, you could determine the, uh, the delta G of that equation using this equation here. What's up? Is ours a like, uh, gas constant? It is. All right, so yes. So let's look at our variables real quick. Let's use, since we calculated our delta G, let's use this right here to figure out what the equilibrium constant for this reaction is. Okay. Um, yes, R is the ideal gas constant. If you remember back to when you were doing with ideal gases, it, the units of R that you choose will di dictate the value that you use. Uh, because we really care about energy here, we're going to use the units of R that have the units joules per Kelvin mole. All right, and that value is 8.314. Okay, and since our values of delta G are kilojoules and our value of R is joules, we're going to have to keep that in mind and square our units away, all right? Let's just think real quick what our temperature is in this equation. That's delta G naught, right? So what temperature am I at when I'm talking about delta G naught? 25 degrees Celsius, all right? So. Uh, converted to Kelvin, that's 298. <clears throat> so plugging this into this equation here, we're going to do E to the negative of our delta G value. So that becomes positive 142. Again, this is kilojoules, which I want to keep in mind. Because then I'm going to divide by 8.314 over 1,000 times that 298K, right? And are we going to expect a number greater than 1 or less than 1? This is a negative delta G, so a spontaneous reaction that favors the products. Is that a KEQ greater than 1 or less than 1? Should be greater than 1, so let's check it out.
All right, and we get some just absolutely massive number. Seven point seven eight four times ten to the twenty four. So indeed, our KEQ strongly favors our products in this reaction. All right, so again, we got this very close relationship between our equilibrium constant and the delta G of our reaction. Both of those are saying whether or not our reaction proceeds towards the products or the reactants. They give us an idea of just how strongly that is, how strongly spontaneous it is, right? So a very large KEQ value is similar to a very large negative delta G, indicating that this reaction very strongly favors the products. All right, so the last thing we got to introduce here is let's go back to our vaporization of water that we discussed. All right, and we said that this reaction was non-spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. And that kind of makes sense because if we pour ourselves a glass of water, we're not really worried about it just poof, spontaneously turning into steam, right? But if I spill a little bit of water on this bench top right here and then I leave for the weekend and I come back, is it going to be there when, on Monday? No, why not? It will evaporate, right? We do still have this concept of evaporation and that is water going from the liquid to the gas phase. So how is that going to happen if our delta G is positive here? It says that this reaction would be non-spontaneous, right? So then how is evaporation spontaneously occurring at 25 degrees Celsius, okay? We have to update our definition of standard state here because the standard state does indeed mean that we are at 25 degrees Celsius, but it's actually even more restrictive than that. It also means that all gases involved are at a pressure of one ATM and all solutions involved have a concentration of one molar, right? So standard state is not only dictating the temperature at which this happens, but also the concentration or the pressure of your species involved. All right? If I spill some water on the bench top here, are we at standard state? Is the pressure of water vapor in this room one ATM? If it was one ATM in here, we'd be having a bad time. We wouldn't be able to breathe and nothing like that, right? The total pressure of gas in this room is one ATM, but it's not all water, right? In fact, only a very small percentage of water. Most of it is nitrogen and then oxygen, a little bit of argon, a little bit too much CO2. Right? There is some water vapor in the room right now, but certainly not one ATM worth of water vapor. Right? So the fact that the pressure of water in this room is way, way less, water vapor in this room is way, way less than standard state explains why this reaction will still happen spontaneously at room temperature. All right? So these values, only good for standard state. That's not all that terribly interesting, right? That means one concentration I can use for this to be useful. So how do we predict whether or not a reaction will occur spontaneously outside of standard state? We got one more equation that we're going to learn about here, and that uses Q, our reaction quotient. Quotient. I don't know how to spell quotient. That's about right. OK? But our Q, our reaction quotient. Remember what Q is. Q is really the same equation as our equilibrium constant, but we can plug in any value that we want, right? The equilibrium constant is only true at equilibrium. Q is when we take that same expression and then plug in any, any other value that we want, right? 
So everybody take a second, and for this reaction here, build me the equilibrium expression for this reaction. All right, so my reaction quotient Q, again, we build this like our equilibrium expression, so products over reactants. Since we're talking about gases in our reaction here, we're going to go ahead and define our equilibrium in terms of pressure of each of these gases. So the pressure of my product, and then what am I going to have to do to that pressure? square it because of the two in my balanced chemical equation divided by the pressure of my reactants okay so this is my reaction quotient here my Q All right, so what we established from our constants page is that at standard state, this reaction is spontaneous, right? So we said spontaneous, but again, that's at standard state, meaning that my temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. But not only that, it also dictates the exact reaction conditions, right? So not only is the temperature 25 degrees Celsius, but the pressure of every gas involved is 1 atm. So if I have 1 atm of oxygen, 1 atm of sulfur dioxide, 1 atm of sulfur trioxide, and I combine these all together, then yes, the reaction will spontaneously proceed towards the product side, start making more sulfur trioxide. So great, that tells me for this one condition here. So how do I figure out whether or not this reaction will occur spontaneous at any other pressure? We have to use this equation here, where the free energy, delta G, without the knot, okay? So this stands for free energy outside of standard state is going to equal that delta G naught. Right, the free energy at standard state plus RT natural log of that reaction quotient Q.
All right. This is a really strongly favorable reaction, so I'm having a hard time finding conditions that it's not. So let's use this to figure out whether our reaction would still be spontaneous at any pressure outside of standard state, right? So let's start with our reaction conditions where we have just an absolute metric crap ton of product here and very, very little reactant, right? With Le Chatelier's principle, we would think that this would shift the reaction over. Okay, so let's say that the pressure of the sulfur trioxide we're going to start out with is 2.5 times 10 to the fifth ATM. All right, so we got a crap ton of product in there. And we're going to start out with our reactants at a very low pressure, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 ATM for oxygen and 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 ATM for our sulfur dioxide. And we're going to plug this into our reaction quotient to figure out what Q would be, and then finally into this equation here to figure out whether or not the reaction is spontaneous under these conditions. All right. there. All right. So plugging in our value for Q, again, we're going to do 2.5 times 10 to the fifth. We got to square it, right? Because that's squared in our reaction quotient, the pressure of our product divided by 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 5 squared. All right, when you're punching this into your calculator, <coughs> in order to keep these both on the bottom, you're going to have to put parentheses around that. So now I'm very far outside of standard state. My Q is 4 times 10 to the 24th. I'm going to go ahead and plug that into this equation here. Our delta G naught was the negative 142. That R is that 8.314. R is on your constants page. It's not something you have to memorize. We do have to keep in mind that it's in joules, though. We've got to square away our units by dividing by 1,000, right? We want everything in kilojoules, so everything matches our units for delta G. Our temperature is going to be that standard state, that 298. And now we're going to take the natural log of that value for Q that we found that 4 times 10 to the 24. All right. So punch that into my calculator, and I get negative 0.54 kilojoules. Under these conditions, is my reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous? Negative delta G, still spontaneous. I didn't do, 
I thought just picking a ridiculously large number and small number would do it, but it turns out that we're still under conditions that favor our products here. We're really close to equilibrium though, right? Almost got that zero, uh, that delta G of zero, but this is still going to spontaneously proceed towards our products. So we can see that this reaction really, really strongly favors the products here. Even if I start out with like, what is that? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, I have 10 to the 10 times more reactant than product, and it still favors my product side. What's up? Um, I got a different calculated answer for delta G. I got negative 1.64. Oh, okay, wait, hold up. I think I had an extra zero on there. Damn it. And now it's all gone. Hold on. Oh my God, let me just start over. Negative 1.6? Okay, my bad. Yeah, all right. Well, I wasn't as close to equilibrium as I thought. We're still at, still in that spontaneous territory, right? So our delta G is smaller, but we still favor our products even under these conditions here, okay? But bottom line is if we want to figure out our, whether or not our reaction is proceeding towards products or reactants outside of standard conditions, we got to use our reaction quotient here, our Q value. Batting a thousand with the calculator today.